Hello, everybody, and welcome to our YouTube educational video on Perfect Smile Clear Aligners. My name is Ali Rizai, and I'm the President and CEO of Show Lab Group. Today, Dr. Sergio Mana will take us through treatment planning with Perfect Smile Clear Aligners. Show Lab Group is a group of digital dental labs serving Canadians for over 75 years. We are highly experienced in fixed, removable, and ortho products. We are specialized crown and bridges, cosmetic, digital dentistry, implants, and we both carry traditional and digital dentures as well. We have locations in greater Toronto area, Kingston, London, and Ottawa. I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Sergio Manai. Dr. Manai graduated from University of Uruguay in 1982. He then finished his post-grad education in orthodontics in Uruguay and Argentina. He has owned and managed his own orthodontics practice for 17 years in Uruguay. He's a tenured faculty member of University of Uruguay. He's done many courses and seminars in Uruguay, Argentina, Brazil, Ecuador, Italy, and Canada. We are proud to have Dr. Mane as a part of our team at Show Lab Group since nine, 2016 um, as Perfect Smile Orthodontic Supervisor. Dr. Mane, over to you. So thank you, Ali, for your uh, introduction and presentation. Uh, so now we are going directly to the course outline. Uh, we will be talking about the clinical records and how to submit the perfect smile case. We will also be seeing a summary of different clinical situations and their possible treatment plan. Uh, we will be seeing digital design resources for a better outcome for the treatment and how can we obtain more predictable results. Um, so all this clear liners therapy started with the work of uh, Dr. Sean John Sheridan uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, Dr. Sheridan uh, worked with uh, SSU Technical at the time, it became more popular, and uh, suggested as a conservative alternative to extractions to create a space between the teeth through a stripping in the interposimal areas. Uh, and that way, with a retainer, to, uh, use it as a line aligner uh, to align the teeth or to correct malocclusions. So actually, uh, the clear alignment therapy is not the invention of any company. It's actually started with the work of Dr. Sheria. And until nowadays, we have our line of clear aligners, Perfect Smile, uh, by Shaw, and we are very proud of them because uh, they are 100% manufactured, treatment plan, and design in Canada. Um, Perfect Smile, as I said, uh, is our line of uh, aligners, and uh, we are talking about them in these uh, special times of COVID because it's a non aerosol generating procedure, um, has minimized in person appointments, and all the most that we are printing with, uh, for the safe setups, we are delivering them for better monitoring of the case. And also because of all the technology that we have now available, including the teledentistry, allows us to do these uh, photos, these checkups from a distance. So I think it's a, a, a good thing to talk about in these times. Also, if you are a doctor that uh, wants to increase the practice income or you want to provide a more comprehensive treatment to your patients, and this includes orthodontic treatment, or you are an orthodontist and you have clients that they want to have treatment with no bracing for the aligners, well, uh, Perfect Smile can be something very helpful for you. Um, Everything is done by sending a case submission form um, and uh, also the records that we need for producing a treatment plan for Perfect Smile. The uh, Perfect Smile case submission form that we design is quite simple in order to, uh, to make uh, our lives a little bit easier. Uh, we divided it in four chapters. The first chapter is about some general information from your practice and the patient. Uh, the second chapter is about the records that you're going to submit, and I want to be clear about this. Um, uh, we can provide you with a 
treatment plan just with uh, one set of impressions or one set of scans. Uh, however, in order to comply with the uh, standard of care of any of the treatment, you should be sending other necessary records for any of the treatment. And these are one set of impressions or scans with the registration, um, photos, facial photos and intraoral photos, and x-rays, panel x-rays and lateral set. If you are submitting a lateral set x-ray, we are going to provide you with a cephalometric analysis at no extra cost. Um, all right, so if you're sending us impressions, the impressions uh, need to be uh, in PBS, ideally. If you are not using PBS and you prefer to use alginate, uh, only alginate that uh, can work for these impressions is the 100 hours alginate. And if you have a practice close to our uh, facilities in Toronto, so we can arrange a 24 hours pickup. Uh, you need to use a good technique because you know everything is just with a good impression, right? Um, if you are sending us scans, well, you you know already that uh, Shoah accepts all kinds of scans. Uh, even if you are sending to Vitero, Sirona, uh, Trios, whatever you have, we accept all kinds of scans. They also have both scans and impressions. They need to have certain extension. Um, uh, we should be covering three to four millimeters of gingival tissue. If you are not able to cover the full palatal bulb, at least the palatal surface up to the second array. We also need good definition of interproximal surfaces and incisal edges. Um, occlusal and distal anatomy of the last tooth in the arch must, must be well recorded and also a proper by registration. Uh, the photos. The facial photos are frontal, a profile, and a high smile. And the intraoral photos are center, right, oh, sorry, right, left, occlusal upper, and occlusal low. The x rays, uh, you have the pano x ray, uh, that's a common record that you're taking whenever you have a uh, clinical exam. Also, full mouth series may work. Please don't send us by wings because by wings they don't work for uh, orthodontic diagnosis. And the lateral step probably a little bit less common in your practice, uh, but it's uh, really important for orthodiagnosis, orthodiagnosis, sorry. Um, as I mentioned with the ortho set, with the lateral set, we're going to provide two cephalometric analysis. And uh, although this, uh, all these numbers and angles and measurements can be a little bit intimidating for, for somebody that's not very familiar with that, uh, the lateral set is also providing a lot of information with all these measurements just by looking at them. Very important information, as I said, uh, for the orthodontic diagnosis. For example, in this one, you can see um, uh, the, sh the shape of the chin the relationship between the cranial base and the mandibular plane, the relationship between uh, anterior teeth and the angle, uh, how these roots are being related with the cortical bone, the, the availability of medullary bone, you can see the airway, you can see the, if you have tonsils. I mean, many, uh, many items of information that are going to be very useful for uh, your treatment plan and for your forecast too. So going to the third portion of the case submission form, you have there some uh, treatment goals that you need to mark. First of all, you're going to let us know if you want to treat uh, both arches of, or only one arch. If we are treating occlusion, occlusion is a system, so we think that we should always be treating uh, both arches. However, if you are doing uh, probably a minor ortho movement in one arch, that's the one that you're going to mark. We have on the left, main treatment objectives, over chat, over by, three to three alignment, etc. And you're going to let us know if you want those to maintain, improve, or to fully correct. And you also need to make sure that those treatment goals are kind of uh, not, uh, they are all possible. Uh, we have seen that sometimes there's some conflict between treatment goals. So please uh, just take your time to, uh, to think a little bit what you want to achieve with your treatment. You're also giving us, in this portion of the form, uh, some information about what to do with the ash width, for inclination, and interproximal reduction. And the final portion of the form is uh, for you to give us more instructions. Um, for example, if you have some teeth 
that they have crowns or any other sort of work or they are implants and you don't want us to plan any of the movement or no composite engages, nothing, just let us know. Uh, there's uh, instructions about uh, space closure and also any other kind of instructions that you couldn't find in the rest of the form, this is the place to write them down. Um, so, um, primo non nocere, this is a Latin expression that uh, we put here, we read it in an article from the Chess of Bono. And uh, we put it over here because it represents exactly what we are thinking whenever we are working with our treatment plan cases. While not specifically in the Hippocratic Oath, primo non nocere is believed to be derived from it and means first do no harm or above else do no harm. In other words, before you do anything to a patient, make sure that you are not making matters worse. And this may sound quite obvious. However, we have seen in some other systems that uh, some things may happen, right? And they are not probably the best for the patient. So we really need to be careful and do, we are doing that, taking care of, of this and keeping this in our mind in other steps of, of our work in the treatment plan. Um, when you're doing your diagnosis, you will basically be doing uh, a list of problems, of situations that eventually uh, you will correct them or not. Uh, uh, and within that list of situations or conditions that you want to, to treat, you may find interarch anomalies. These are the ones that are related with an individual tooth or group of teeth within a dental arch. This may be inclinations, displacements, crowding, transposition, spaces, dental anatomical anomalies, like you know, anomalies in size, shape, or number. Um, when you are checking the occlusion of both arches together, you may find uh, malocclusions that are affecting the dental alveolar structures or the skeletal or both. Um, in perfect smile, we are treating teeth with uh, teeth in permanent dentitions. We are not treating yet a misdentition. Um, so in general, most of our cases are patients that are done with their growth. Eventually, we may have some remaining growth. But in general, we are working more in, uh, with the dental labular structures, like most of the treatment. The skeletal discrepancies are falling more into the surgical field. However, a very common situation is to find malocclusions affecting dental alveolar structures, but also with a skeletal component that uh, probably we can mask somehow by producing an orthodontic treatment that generates some dental compensation to mask that skeletal discrepancy. When we are checking the malocclusion, you may find in the vertical plane uh, an open bite or a deep bite. The malocclusion in the transverse plane or horizontal plane to be cross bite, scissors bite, midline shift, or compressed arches. And in the anterior posterior plane, the sagittal plane, this could be a class one with crowding, a class two, uh, that could be division one, division two, or subdivision, which is affecting only one side. Or you may find a class three, real class three, cellular class three, or subdivision, which is affecting only one side. Um, the classification of malocclusions is much more complex than this. We are just oversimplifying it a little bit for the sake of the presentation. Um, so now we're going to see some examples of interarch anomalies that we can find. Uh, in this photo, you may see on the left side some uh, overdeveloped marginal ridges in this teeth that although they are not uh, representing any kind of uh, cosmetic problem from the labial side. Uh, whenever the patient is occluding, these overdeveloped marginal reaches are creating inclined planes, and this is going to affect the, it's going to create most likely malpositions in the opposite arch uh, or crowding um, and some sort of interferences too. So often after the orthodontic treatment, these uh, overdeveloped marginal reaches need to be recontoured. On the right side, <clears throat> you can see uh, certain crowding in the upper arch. There is also some dental discrepancies. This one central here that is uh, slightly wider than the other central. 
on one lateral, but this is slightly wider than the other lateral on our kind of anomaly. You may also find diastema. In this case, the diastema seems to be associated with a big frenulum. But we can also encounter diastemas that are being generated because there is a discrepancy in the width of the upper teeth with the lower teeth. We call it the bottom discrepancy, or just because there are uh, problems with the shape and size of any of the teeth. And probably, as we also saw in the lower arch, a very common situation too. Uh, in the arches malocclusion, we are going to see some samples of them, some clinical situations. Before going into those, uh, for those of you that you are not completely familiar with the classification uh, of malocclusions, especially, especially the ones uh, in the sagittal plane, I just want to make a, a brief comment about it. Um, when we are talking about uh, class one, class two, and class three, we are talking about the angle classification that has been around for a long, long time. Um, the class one could be more kind of the normal, in which the upper canine is falling between the lower and lower canine and first lower bicuspid. And the mesolabial cuspid of the upper molar is falling, uh, uh, matching the labial groove of the molar six in the lower arch. When these anatomical references in the lower arch are falling distal of where they should be, then we have a class two. When these anatomical references in the lower arch are falling initial of where they should be, then we have a class three. So angle classification is a dental classification, but this can be affecting only the canine relationship or molar relationship or both, only one side or the other side. It may, may also have a skeletal component. You may also classify uh, skeletal discrepancies as uh, a skeletal class two and a skeletal class three. This can be also associated with some functional problems too, so it's much more complex than that, but at least just for the presentation, we have a simple vision of it. Whenever we are treating these orthodontic cases, when we want to get a class one, but not only the sagittal plane, if we want to correct any other uh, malocclusion, in most cases, we need to create a space somehow. And this space is going to be created through pro-inclination. This means the inclination to the labia of the teeth, or through extraction, or expansion of the arch, or interproximal reduction. Um, can the same procedure be applied in every case in the same way? Well, of course not, right? And we already uh, talked about that uh, often we have uh, one diagnosis. Diagnosis is only one, and probably different in their goals. So this could be probably uh, creating different needs for a space and different ways of doing it. But also, the way we create a space is related with what kind of patient we are treating. For example, in this two lateral set, we can see on the left side, the lateral set x-ray of a brachiofacial patient. This patient, in general, they have a, a small angle between the cranial base and the mandibular plane. Also, the mandibular angle is like more close. Uh, these patients in general has a, they have um, a horizontal growth pattern. This means that the mandible is growing more in the anterior posterior plane rather than vertical. Um, they have the tendency to have a deep bite. They have strong muscles. Uh, and these in general are not cases uh, that are good for creating spaces to extraction. Because if you are extracting teeth, you are reducing uh, that. Uh, uh, you are reducing whatever is opposed into the strength of those muscles. Uh, these are cases that they are in general good for creating space to pro inclination, as long as the relationship between the axis of the teeth and the mandibular plane are still within the norm. Um, so these are generalities about this case. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, on the right side, we can see a dolicofacial patient. The dolicofacial patient, if you see the, the angle between the cranial base and the mandibular plane, and also the mandibular angle, the angles are much more open, widely open. Uh, these are patients that have weaker muscles. They have the tendency to have open bites. Uh, the chin here seems to be a little bit more sorry, more hidden backwards, as opposed to the brachiofacial that is a little bit more prominent. 
uh, these are in general not good cases to create a space through proinclination. The cortical bone seems to be quite close in many cases. There's not too much a med medullary bone. Uh, as I said, the, the muscles are weaker, so you need to be careful not to create through expansion or through any other ortho movement uh, an occlusal interference in the posterior teeth that may produce an increase in the vertical dimension because it's very hard to go back to correct that. Uh, these ortho cases may work quite well with uh, extractions if that's a, a way of creating the space. And within the brachiofacial and the dorico-facial, you may find a lot of different situations there that they are all normal, including the mesofacial patient. Um, so let's see some cases of uh, malocclusion. We can see here an open bite. This is a case that doctors send us all the records, including a lateral set. We were able to see that this case had a, uh, is a, a tonicofacial patient. So also has the tendency to have a, a skeletal open bite. And this is our treatment plan. We try to close that uh, open bite, uh, moving the arterial teeth, correcting the misalignment, and without trying to correct too much, trying to move too much the posterior teeth. This is the treatment plan from the frontal view. You can see the same uh, animation of the treatment plan from the right side. As you can see, the teeth are being pulled towards the occlusal plane, uh, and we are correcting the misalignment without doing too much movement in the posterior teeth. So this is basically what we were treatment planning. Uh, in order to move those teeth towards the occlusal plane, we had to design composite engages. Composite engages are these little uh, bumps of composite uh, that um, sometimes can be optional for certain of the movements. They have different designs. We're going to mention them later. But whenever you are moving a tooth towards the occlusal plane, you are extruding teeth, you must have those composite engages. They really increase uh, the engagement that we may have between the liner and, uh, and the tooth. So it's very important in order to have the right uh, force to produce the open movement. We have another case here. This is a deep bite. This is also affecting uh, in the vertical plane. You can see here that um, uh, the upper teeth are almost covering the lower. The patient, patient may show a concern was certain attrition that the, the teeth were suffering. And uh, we were also able to see in the photos that there was some thick bone here in front of the lower anterior incisors. It seems that the deep bite was affecting more the lower than the upper. Um, also in the photos, we were able to see that the upper arch was in quite good shape, although there was some small uh, rotations there, and the lower arch was not. Actually, most of the lower teeth were anterior, were migrated towards the occlusal plane. There were some inclinations there, and some uh, misaligned teeth. So in our treatment plan, we designed our composite engagers, uh, and we also plan to do some interpersonal reduction between uh, the left canine and first by caspi because doctor wanted to create some space in order to correct uh, certain dental midline shift in the lower arch. Uh, in our treatment plan, and you can see the animation on the frontal view, you can uh, observe how the teeth are being uh, uh, moved, correcting the deep bite and also correcting that dental midline shift. This is the correction from the right side. You can see that in the animation, how we were planning the teeth to be moved. There is a slight inclination of, of the upper teeth too. And this is on the left side, how these teeth are being moved in a similar fashion. All right, so for this case, um, uh, you can see here the movement in the upper arch is very minimal. We did an average of uh, 1.2 millimeters of intrusion in the anterior teeth, which is considerable. And uh, we also did uh, an average of almost six degrees of proinclination in the lower arch, because we thought that we were safe according to the volume of bone that we saw in that other process. We have here another case. This is affecting mostly the sagittal plane. It's a class two subdivision two. 
also has a big bite. Uh, the doctor's uh, request for this treatment was mainly to correct the misalignment, the rotation of the teeth, and the deep bite. Uh, and also the case presented, although the photo on the right side didn't uh, cover that, uh, scissors bite affecting the molar 2.7 and the 3.7. So what doctor decided was to create uh, a treatment for those uh, molar 7s to correct our cross bite with bands. One band in the upper molar 7, one band in the lower molar 7 with buttons and cross elastics in order to correct that scissors bite in a faster way. And after that, we started our treatment with aligners to correct the rest of the treatment goals. Uh, we designed our composite engages, we designed our frontal movement, and we also plan these lingual ramps that uh, are going to help uh, the treatment by reinforcing all the intrusive forces that we are generating with the liners. Uh, and they're also changing the proprioception. So whenever those lower incisal latches are contacting the, the ramps, uh, kind of the muscles have the tendency to relax. Mm, the picture on the right is showing the composite engages that you will need to do with a template, with a template that we are going to provide. The blue images on the left side, these ramps, these are not composite. These are just digitally designed for being thermoformed in the liner. So um, they are uh, different, right? Uh, the treatment plan that we made for this case, you can see here the animation in the frontal view, was addressing what the doctor requested. Mostly rotations, misalignment, and the divide. On the right view of the treatment plan, you can see how the teeth are moving. So we were proclining the upper, proclining the lower, correcting the deep bite, and correcting the rotations. And on the left side, the teeth are moving similarly and, and the same way, similar fashion. So can this case be treated in a different way, probably addressing more the societal problem or the class two relationship? Yes, it, it could. Uh, that was not the treatment goal for, for this case. So what we did was address that, and this is a treatment plan that is also valid for the kids. We're talking about an adult, right? Um, but um, there are many ways of treating class two malocclusions or malocclusions in the sagittal plane. Uh, you may find, for example, a class two like this one on the bottom of the picture, and you want to transform that into a real class one. So you want to really correct the sagittal problem. So the question is, can we do this with perfect smile aligners? Yes, we can. It's not a problem. As long as we agree together in how we're going to obtain space for that case. For example, if you have a class two like this one, this is more than a four millimeters uh, class two. So the canine is probably falling five or six millimeters farther from where it should be. Uh, so are we going to do extractions of fibroid caspids and then we're going to plan to move those teeth backwards and probably creating some uh, uh, lingual torque of those teeth, and if there is any remaining gap, probably moving the posteriors towards the initial to close the gap, uh, or are we probably not doing instructions but doing some expansion and interpersonal reduction, trying to move those upper teeth towards the distal and bring in the lower and, and moving the posterior lower towards the initial too with IPR. So these are the kind of things that we need to discuss in order to use the line properly to correct. Or you may see uh, as a possible treatment goal to reduce the double check, probably correct the rotations and the alignment of the anterior teeth, and trying to reduce a little bit the aspect of the class two, but not be uh, uh, addressing exactly the sagittal correction of the class two. That's a valid treatment plan too, as long as we are improving the patient condition, as long as we are not producing any harm. On the left side, we see here another class two that was affecting mostly the canine relationship and was uh, immersed in a, a skeletal frame of class three. There were some spaces in between the two teeth. So in our treatment plan, we actually we were moving initially the lower, we were closing the anterior spaces and we were uh, briefly inclining the upper anterior. That was, a, that was also a way of correct and interesting, but there are many different ways and many different treatment plans. 
um, you may also encounter the situation like this case that the doctor sent to us where the case had a, an important crowding in the lower arch but one lateral had uh, severe periodontal problems and doctor decided to oh, sorry doctor decided to uh, extract the tooth and to correct the crowding utilizing that space of the structure so we were correcting uh, that crowding then by closing that gap uh, you can see in the frontal animation how the space is being corrected and also check in the upper arch that uh, there were um, uh, the canines were in a labial position in a labial version they were rotated there were some misalignment in, in those teeth when we plan the treatment checking the crucial arch you will see the animation there that the teeth are moving uh, kind of towards with a certain constriction of the width of the arch uh, in the lower we are moving the teeth closing that gap filling the space of extraction. Someone may ask why in the upper arch we are uh, creating space by interposing reaction. That's what we did. We didn't expand the arch. We did some sort of constriction and we created space with interpersonal reaction. We did that because in the lower arch we were uh, constricting the arch due to the extraction. So in the upper arch we kind of go with an expansion. Uh, whatever we do in the horizontal plane needs to be coordinated between upper and lower arches. All right, so we have here uh, a different situation that you may find. Probably your case needs a bridge or a pond or um, an implant after your orthodontic treatment. You can also plan your treatment, your orthodontic treatment with perfect smile with um, pontics in the liners. You just give us the, the two shape and we will proceed with the aligners doing that kind of uh, um, a brief comment about some orthodontic movements that are more difficult in general. They are more difficult with uh, any kind of ortho techniques, but also with uh, free aligners. Uh, these are the root torque, the posterior body movement, posterior teeth to distal, especially six and sevens, and the posterior scissors bias correction. Why this movement are a little bit more difficult? Well, probably because they have. Uh, they are facing a bigger surface of bone that they need to reabsorb and to a position in order to produce the movement. But also there are some other factors that can make these situations worse. And these are the posterior teeth cast height. If they are too high, the engagement in the occlusion is going to be even more. The occlusal function, it may get in our way whenever we are doing a treatment plan. The biotype, we talked earlier about uh, dolicofacials and brachiofacials and the difference between them. The available medullary bone, we need the medullary bone to move the teeth, and the root proximity towards the cortical bone. Um, some ortho treatments are more uh, achievable, uh, a little bit easier to accomplish, and these are rotations, open bite, deep bite, anterior cross bite, and crowding. And I need to say that these are easier to achieve as long as we have enough space. So that's a, that's a secret, that's a challenge. Um, if we have enough space, these kind of treatments are uh, quite uh, achievable. Um, if we don't have a space, well, then the challenge is going to be how we're going to create a space. And we go back to that slide that I was showing before, how we can create a space for an auto treatment. If we have diastemas, well, in that case, the space is not going to be the challenge because the space is already there. However, uh, the fact that we have spaces between the teeth, and even worse, if we have some bone distortion, we can have problems to put the, the aligners in, onto the teeth and to take them out. So that is why for many cases with diastemas, we are using a different kind of material, the perfect smile flex, that is pretty similar to the, our regular perfect smile material, but it's more flexible. The only difference is that uh, we need to ask the patients to switch aligners every week instead of every, every two weeks, like with our Perfect Smile Regular. Finally, you will receive a form which is telling you uh, the uh, Perfect Smile product that we're going to use, how many aligners we're going to use, where we're going to place our composite engages, uh, where we need to do the interpersonal reduction, 
And if there is any specific information about interpersonal relations, it's going to be written there too. Huh? Um, you will receive an email. And in that email, you will have the form that we just showed and also the teeth movement report, some final pictures of the final setup, and animation files, similar to the one that we were uh, showing a moment ago, showing how the teeth are going to the initial situation to the final one. Uh, so you can show that to your patient too. You are also going to uh, receive two cephalometric analyses. One is the stainer cephalanalysis uh, that is uh, quite uh, common in the, in the world. The other one is a more comprehensive one, the Ricketts analysis, that regardless of all these measurements that probably you may not feel familiar with them, uh, I think that it is also going to be useful because on, at the bottom of it, it has this summary analysis uh, that has a class one, for example, class one molar relationship, the skeletal class two, retrusive mandible, deep overbite. So you can compare that uh, radiographic uh, diagnosis with your clinical diagnosis, and also can be useful if you need to fill a form for insurance purposes, for insurance purposes. You will be also receiving uh, one set of aligners zero. They will be delivered at Novastar Cross with a visual treatment plan. They are processed on the models that are uh, obtained from the impressions that you sent. So they will be able, you will be able to confirm the accuracy of the impressions that you submitted. They will also be helpful in case presentation and patient education. And if a scans were submitted, these aligners zero are going to be delivered with the rest of the lab. Um, you are going to find different treatment options. Uh, Perfect Smile Light is up to three aligners. Uh, Perfect Smile Trio 1 will be up to six aligners. This is single arch and double arch. All the tiers are single arch and double arch. Tier 2 up to 12, tier 3 up to 18, tier 4 up to 24, and Perfect Smile Unlimited, also single arch and double arch. Now we're going to see uh, a few cases that we have to share. Uh, this is uh, the son of one of our colleagues here at show. That is why we are able to share some facial photos. These are the initial, frontal, and profile. The patient, the patient major concern to address was the growling in the upper and lower arches, the misalignment of the teeth. This case also presented some the dental discrepancies in width between the centrals and between the laterals. And doctors specifically didn't want to do uh, too much IPR. Um, you can see initial on the left and final photo on the right. You can see how the treatment evolved, how this crowding has been corrected quite well. Our final photos are not real final because the doctors are sending, the, sending us sometimes these records and uh, before the retainers. So we can still can see over there the composite engagers. Uh, as I said, these are not my photos, I'm just relying on the generosity of some of our customers that they decide to share uh, some photos with us of the final treatment. This is how the case looked at the initial and the final photo on the left side. The misalignment has been really uh, uh, greatly improved. Upper arch of crucial view, initial and final, and lower arch, initial and final. Here we have a close up of the smile. Uh, some uh, size discrepancies between the centers, so I decided to correct that with some denticule procedure. And this is the initial and final photo of the frontal face and smile. We think we work quite well. We have another case here. It was referred by an orthodontist. The case presented. Uh, uh, Crowding in both arches, upper and lower. Some cross by here, misalignment. And that was the major concerns to, of the case to be collected. We are here too. Um, this is the initial photo and the final, still with some composite engages, but you can see how the cross by was corrected and the alignment was greatly improved. Uh, that photo is a little blurry. In this one, you can see in a better way how the situation was greatly improved. This is the initial and final aspects of uh, the right side. 
initial and final from the left side. This is a composite event. So close by when everything was solved. This is the upper arch, not to sell view. It's much more aligned. And the lower arch, also corrected to from the previous view. Uh, another case here, this patient presented some gaps in the lower arch due to the uh, absence of one incisor. I don't know if it was extracted or it was never there. There, was, there were also big gaps in the lower arch, and some gaps in the upper anterior. Uh, there was a cross bite in the canine level. This lower mandibular canine was uh, greatly rotated. We need to do almost like 40 degrees to take that into the situation, into the normal situation. And in order to correct this big gap, we had to plan posterior moving towards the initial because it was not enough just to re incline the upper anteriors and the lower anteriors. This is the initial and final photo of the case. You see how this, all these gaps were closed and all the, teeth, all the teeth were aligned. Also the cross bite were corrected on both sides. This is the initial and final from the right side. I repeat, all these teeth by Caspi and Mola Season 7 were also moved towards the initial. The initial and final aspect of the upper arch of the view. And the initial and final photo of the lower arch. See how all these teeth were moved towards the initial and all these big gaps where one tooth is missing, was missing has disappeared. Also this canine had a, a big rotation, which is kind of difficult when you're working in the manual. So let's mention now some digital design resources that we have for a better outcome in our treatment. Um, there are a few things that we are doing in our digital design that really help us a lot to have a more predictable treatment and better results. These are the composite attachments that we, we have seen them earlier today. Uh, they are very important to increase the retention of the liner. These are, at the end of the day, removal devices and retention and anchorage are really very valuable. Uh, anchorage also is uh, the reinforcement of some forces that are being generated into the, uh, through the aligner. Sometimes we need to take some teeth uh, as anchorage and move another side of the arch. So the teeth that are not moving are helping us in getting more anchorage for our ortho movement. And also these composite engagers have different uh, designs according to the specific orthodontic movement that we're going to plan. We also have the, the opportunity to uh, choose and to design the center of resistance of, the, of each tooth that's going to be the pivot of the ortho movement. We are also able to uh, adjust the axis of, of each tooth but it's going to give us more uh, accuracy with the ortho movement too. Um, we have these uh, arch forms that is, we use them uh, sometimes as a reference for aligning the teeth. We have a staging. The staging is a very important procedure in the digital design and allow us to um, uh, move the teeth in a sequence, trying to avoid the collisions between the teeth when they are going from one so set up to the next one. Um, if the teeth are moving and they are kind of colliding between each other or they have too much friction, then the treatment is not going to work very well. You need to have those teeth uh, with the space or with minimal friction in order to, to progress in the treatment. So we can do that through a station. That's why we think it's a very, very important procedure and uh, we are always uh, doing for all of our treatments. We also can superimpose a uh, CT or CBCT scan with our digital models. Uh, this is not a part of our workflow yet, but uh, we are ready. We have all the tools. And uh, when the moment is right, we are going to start doing it. I think this is being done for some other kind of uh, treatments, I think with infants or something else. So the good thing about this superimposition is that uh, you will see your teeth uh, related with the bone, the direction of the teeth, how they are related with the cortical, with the medullary bone, and between each other. And you can treatment plan in a much more accurate way. 
So we are uh, really uh, looking forward to have this as part of our workflow pretty soon. There is another case that I wanted to share with you. Uh, this is a case that is not finished. It's a case in progress, uh, but has been such a good progress that I thought it was interesting to share. The case right now is uh, using the set of aligners, I think it is number 16. These are the all initial photos. Uh, this is a class three malocclusion. Check the canine and molar relationship. They are but per se quite difficult to treat. There is a huge dental discrepancy. Look how little space we have here in the upper arch for accommodating this teeth. Look in the lower arch. Big dental bone discrepancy too and severe rotations. So the, there was a treatment plan created with some expansion, with interproximal reduction, and trying to adjust it as we could. Doctor did a great job. This is uh, the initial photo and this is the progress photo in the alignment number 16. You can still see the composite engages, but you can see how uh, the treatment has progressed a lot during this portion of the treatment from the frontal view. This is from the right side. Cross bite has been corrected. The alignment in lower arches and upper arch, lower arch and upper arch is uh, really great to improve. In a similar situation with uh, the left view, upper and lower arches, initial and progress photo. This is the initial and progress photo of the upper arch, in the occlusal view. See how the teeth are being accommodated there somehow. And this is an initial and progress photo of the lower arch from the occlusal view in which the teeth are getting more and more aligned. Um, I would like to comment with you, how can we obtain more predictable results? Why? Because in general, whenever we are studying an orthodontic treatment, there is always uh, some percentage of unpredictability. And this is with all the uh, techniques. Uh, Perfect smile is not exception. Clear aligners are not exception to that. But we think that there are some things that we can do to reduce the percentage of unpredictability and to probably move towards a more uh, predictable result. One thing is the case selection. If you are just starting doing other treatments and you are a general practitioner, and if you have the option to choose a case that are more simple to start, that's a good thing to have a more predictable result. If you don't have the option and you have to correct something that is more complex and you don't feel very comfortable with it, well, keep in mind that we are here to help. If you want to give us a call or if you have anything to discuss, if you are able to help, just we will be very glad to do that. Um, also take all the necessary records. We, have, we talked today about uh, complying with the standard of care of any of our treatment. If you have more records and uh, we have all of them, and we know more about your case, we can help you by producing a better treatment plan for your case. Also check the disposition of the mandible. Not very often people are talking about this, but this is important in orthodontic treatment. Even if you are treating a, a, a class three malocclusion in the surgical plane, right? You may encounter a class two or a class three when the teeth are occluding, but often by checking the mandible in the rest position when the teeth are not occluding, you may find that the muscles are taking the mandible to a slightly different situation, uh, to be closer to a class one for example. So in those cases, the focus of the, uh, of the treatment may vary. Also, it's important to check the rest position when we are uh, correcting a middle line shift. Sometimes it can be dental, can be probably uh, due to a mandibular shift, not only dental. So these are things to consider. Also consider the patient chief complaint. Make a list of problems with establishing your diagnosis and plan carefully your treatment goals with reasonable expectations. Be aware that a successful achievement of your treatment goals may take more aligners than what you may think. This is related with uh, the fact that the biomechanic of aligners is not the same as other techniques. These, at the, day, at the end of the day, are removable devices. And sometimes if you are moving, for example, for teeth, posterior teeth, all of them uh, was the initial or the distal, sometimes you cannot do that at once, you just need to move one area and then another part of the arch. So that is why it may take a few more lines. 
always try and carefully inspect the feet of the liner zero. Remember that we are delivering those liner zero to uh, confirm the accuracy of the impression. If, it's, if it does not fit properly, all the rest of the liners, they are not going to, to work as they should. And the result is not going to be very predictable. Try not to avoid the use of composite engages. When these are being designed, we know that some doctors probably may don't like them, or the, or the patient may say, I don't want those composite engages. Well, uh, if we are planning them, it's because they are really very, very helpful for the efficiency in the orphan movement. So whenever it is possible, please just allow us to, to plan them with you. Patient satisfaction. That's a very important part of our success whenever we are treating a case, right? So um, you need to educate your patient about treatment expectations, interproximal reduction, engages, and retention before going ahead with the treatment. Mm, the use of retainers should not be a surprise for the patient after you are uh, taking out the last aligner. So take the time to educate the patient about everything that they are going to go through uh, when you are embarking into the orthodontic or treatment. When the personal reduction is indicated, try to always use hand instruments. We know that some doctors prefer to use the hand piece of the tube line. Um, when you're doing that, you are increasing the risk of overdoing the interpersonal reduction. Uh, by doing so, you may be uh, affecting, you may be changing the anatomical features of the teeth. And once the enamel is gone, it's gone forever. So we strongly recommend uh, to use hand instruments whenever interpersonal reduction is indicated. It may take up a few more minutes, but it's going to be safer and you're going to have a more uh, predictable result too. Always monitor the treatment as much as possible. Be aware of when it may be necessary to intervene. As soon as you check something that is not going to, it's not working completely okay, you need to intervene. Uh, take some photos, let us know what, what's going on. Is the patient using the liner? Just don't give a box of aligners to the patient and ask the patient to come back six months later. Uh, many things can, uh, can happen uh, in the middle and they can probably create an unpredictable result. Uh, we're going to see a couple more cases. These are my final cases to show. Uh, in this one, uh, the patient major concern was a big gap in the upper anterior teeth, but there were diastemas everywhere. Also, there was big spaces here in the lower arch. Uh, the person that was taking the photos, it seems I was having some issues to take the labial aspect of the posterior teeth. That is why I also added our initial digital design. Uh, check here in this frontal view, our treatment plan was involving the anterior closure of the space, but also moving all the posterior teeth towards the mission. That was the only way of doing it. Um, uh, this uh, initial movement of the posterior and anterior teeth was planned both for the upper and the lower arches. This is an occlusal view, initial photo. This is the initial digital design. And you can see in our treatment plan from the occlusal view, how the animation is showing how all the teeth are moving towards the initial, the space are being closed with a lot of orphan movement. And even uh, one small diastema was kept over there at the end to match the occlusal alignment of the lower teeth. Big gap here, eh? Um, this is the aspect of the lower arch. These are the initial photos. Look at this huge gap over here. Certain crowding, in my, we can see that in the digital initial file, and some other diastemas on the other side. So the plan was to close these gaps by uh, uh, uncorrected crowding using those spaces. See how the posterior teeth from seven to five by cuspid are all being uh, planned to be moved towards the initial with the liners. I think that's two millimeters and a half, it was really a lot. Um, I forgot to tell you that uh, the molar rays in the upper arch were planned to be extracted. Uh, this is the aspect of the animation in the right side. See how the teeth are uh, accommodating the surgical relationship, more into a plus one, while the anterior are also closing the space. In a similar fashion, the animation of the treatment plan from the left side. And yes, let's see what happened now with the treatment. 
So here we have the initial photo and final photo of the anterior view. Uh, in the retainer, we had a certain correction of the tipping of the central. This central had to move much more than the other tooth, but the patient was very happy of uh, having all these anterior spaces correct. Also, the, the lower posterior spaces were also corrected too. Um, you can see in this initial photo the space, and probably you can try to see in the final that this gap was completely close. This is uh, how the left side looks initial and final photo. These gaps were close too. Uh, initial and final photo of the occlusal view of the upper arch. All, this, all the gaps are completely close. This is initial photo of the crowding. This is the final photo with the crowding solved. And this is the final photo of the occlusal arch of the lower arch, sorry, from an occlusal view with all the spaces correct. I repeat that all these posterior teeth were also moved initially. Here you can see how the space was this big and it was closed in our final photo. Similar fashion on the left side. And this is our final case. Um, we don't have all the dental photos of this case, but we share some facial photos because the patient that is one of our co-workers allow us to do so, so thank you for that. Uh, the patient major concern in this case was that uh, misalignment of arterial teeth, the upper canine was in a severe um, labial version, was also in an infraocclusion, was not reaching the occlusal plane, and there was some other problems there. This case had an extraction of the molar six of, on the right side, and another extraction, I think, so we took advantage of other space to correct uh, this misalignment and this severe malposition of the upper canine. You can see here the initial photo and final photo from the frontal view. Uh, in the final, the patient is not completely biting, but you see, can see how the case greatly improved. Uh, this is the final photo on the right side. You see, you can see the composite images there. This is a molar seven. This is the second bicuspid. So this is the space of the molar six that we really took advantage of it to correct all the situation. This is the final view, initial and final, sorry, occlusal aspect of the upper arch. These are the final photos from the right side and left side. The teeth are, the teeth are really aligned and the patient major concern was addressed. This is a close up of the smile, initial and final. The patient here is using the retainer, but still you can see the change. And these are the facial photos of our patient, initial and final. Uh, so we think that the case really worked out very well. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for joining us today and uh, being able to share this information about the smile with us today. And uh, now we're going with Ali because he needs to tell you some more things. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mann. I, I hope everybody enjoyed the video so far. So if you're thinking about providing clear aligners in your practice, uh, remember, we are made local. We are a Canadian company. So if you think Supporting a Canadian company in these difficult times is a good idea. Please reach out to us. Reach out to us. You will definitely have more control. Dr. Sergio Manai is supported by a great group of dental technicians, but he will supervise every single case and he will be along the way with you throughout the, throughout the treatment of your patient. As a dental lab, we have been serving dentists for 75 years. Uh, we understand your needs. We are flexible. Um, we are not a large organization, so we can adapt to your preferences. We also have a very competitive pricing. Please reach out to us to understand more about the pricing. If you decide to provide perfect smile clear aligners in your office and grow your practice, we can have lunch and learn with your staff, so we expand the knowledge to your staff as well. 
you will get posters from us that you can install in your practices. There will be patient brochures for your patient to pick it up and read and familiarize themselves with the program. Our case boxes will come with number trays for ease of use, and we will have guidelines printed for doctors and patients. Contact us today to learn more about us, learn more about Perfect Smile and get this going. You can visit us at shawlapgroup.com and we will have our phone number listed there for you to get in touch with us. See you soon.